SG Reads. Hello, fellow travelers. My name's SG, and welcome to the channel. Today, since it's the anniversary of the Five Nights at Freddy's this week, I thought it'd be interesting to do a theory, something that's been bothering me for a long time, something that has been in and out of the game franchise for as long as we've known, and that person is Henry himself. While he is a main part of the overall story, has rarely appeared in any games, starting with FNAF 6, mentioned here and there in games before, and definitely brought up in games after, but his presence is felt throughout the whole series. But what has he done really that we know of? Who is he working with? And why does it all matter? And surprisingly enough, I looked into this and I think I have a reasonable theory for it. And oddly enough, it all ties to FNAF World. So, for now, if you like this content, please leave a like, comment, subscribe down below, and let's get started, shall we? What we do know about Henry is that he is definitely one of the co-owners of the Freddy Fazbear Pizzeria Company. Whether he is a successful businessman or not is up in the air, but what we can tell is that he is the mind behind the animatronics themselves. Designer and builder of them is given and hinted at in several different games and books that that was him Henry's position as far as we know but then his presence suddenly becomes less and less prominent after the death of his daughter Charlie Emily who is of course as we all know the puppet or marionette depending on your stance on that and seems to disappear shortly after that biding his time and making his appearance in Five Nights at Freddy's 6 Pizza Maria Simulator now does that have any weight to what we know does that come back to haunt him in later on in the future? Well, I do think that there is certain things that have been pointed out that can, for a fact, be mentioned in the game series. In fact, I could tell you that his presence is probably felt all the way back in Five Nights at Freddy's 2. Well, how and why? We're about to dive into that, aren't we? But before we talk about the full-on theory, let's talk about the second person involved in this theory. This one being someone no one's seen or heard of, and is just barely mentioned in the recent games such as Security Breach, Ruin, and in the second volume of Fazbear Frights. So I'm talking about the independent indie developer who went rogue and started making all these propaganda against the Fazbear Entertainment Company. I think that he and Henry are working together in some way, shape, or form. That I can actually back with certain things that we've seen. Now, as I said, there's not much to be said about the rogue indie game developer himself, but there are several hints that we get from the books, such as the Tales from the Pizza Plex Volume 2, Help Wanted, m almost matching that of the game from Five Nights at Freddy's Help Wanted itself. But in that, we get this idea that Sam was a game developer who was failing at it and was hired by Fazbear Entertainment to build this kind of game system, to help build this kind of propaganda, self-made propaganda nonetheless, to help boost the image of the Freddy's um, brand in a way that makes it seem like a joke of a real life incident or at the same time make it seem like they're in on the joke themselves, bringing pop popularity to them and also to Sam himself, only for them to turn their back on him and it to be a trap set for him. Now how does that relate to the main theory? Well, I do say that, as most people who have read the books and played the games know, the books aren't always the greatest source of canon material, but there are certain elements that we can take and push forward into the main canon. The fact that they're both game indie developers tells me that this may have a bigger key to the storyline so far, and if he's a good game maker, good game developer, he would look into the games themselves. By which I mean the main history of Fazbear Entertainment. He would have to go and talk to people, go see what really happened, get a full idea of what happened, creating the game Five Nights at Freddy's in the game world. But what does that mean with Henry? Well, the only other person that would be able to tell what happened in this world to this character would be Henry. William Afton has gone missing, there is no spring trap. He would only be able to get records from news articles, from uh, newspapers, autopsies, police officers. But 
if we are right in assuming that maybe he even created the side games, the mini games that we get from FNAF 2 all the way up to now, that would suggest that maybe he had deeper information on the history of Fazbear Entertainment as a whole. But can we back that up actually? I think we actually can. In Pizzeria Simulator, we are able to play different mini games, such as Midnight Motorist and Fruity Maze, along with those kinds of titles. And even in the newer titles with Princess Quest, we do get this idea that we are able to play mini games in game. These are all physical games that seem to be happening in this world. But who created them? And why do they look so familiar? They look familiar because they look like the mini games we see back in Five Nights at Freaks 2, 3, and 4. It's odd and it does add up. They are made in the same style and we don't know who made those games either. It's to suggest that maybe whoever this indie game developer is working for uh, Fazbear Entertainment made these mini games such as Midnight Motorist and Fruity Maze in an attempt to kind of tell the story of the missing children's cases of William Afton. Because if we pay attention, no names are given in game. There is only Mustard Man or Yellow Guy or Purple or the Purple Guy himself. We have no names, no nothing going forward. And if we play the games without actually going forward with or seeking out extra stuff, we wouldn't get any of that. Just like a Midnight Motorist, if we just played it as a regular racing game, getting through the street, it's nothing happens. It's a hidden detail the further we go into it. Same thing can be said for Fruity Maze. There's no physical way that anybody could actually win it without having to use it or being able to use some sort of skill to get through it. It makes sense because this is a pizzeria game. Not meant to be won, but meant for tickets more than anything else. So what does that mean? Well, the fact that they are physically similar, along with visually similar, and even having a similar storyline in each one, it can be safe to say that they were made by the same creator or at least have the fingerprints of the same creator, whether somebody knows it or not. Now I know what you're thinking, that the first mini games that we've seen in the series don't look that good, not like Fruity Maze or not like Midnight Motorist. They seem very generic, they seem very clunky, and that's because I believe that they aren't meant to be played by regular audiences. They are meant to be played by a certain individual. They are kind of like hidden code games. Games that you would have to dig into the archives to achieve. Or have to be told specifically where to find them. And the only ones we know being able to play these games as of right now has been Michael Afton, who we are assuming is the main protagonist throughout all the games. He's had to be the one to find them. He's had to be the one to get the information, find the codes, and be able to put it all together. In fact, that's the whole point of trying to find Happiest Day, isn't it? That you are able to find all the codes, figure the secrets, and be able to get the best ending you can as Michael Afton. So, does that mean that the indie game developer was pushing Michael to this realization of what was happening to these animatronics? And I think yes. Do I think that the indie game developer knew this off bat? That's why he agreed to do this for Fazbear Entertainment? No. I think what is the most likely scenario is that in his research of the Fazbear Entertainment history, of the dark history, and even going into the Fazbear Frights locations, he managed to find somebody who was alive at that time, who was a bigger part of it, who knew what was happening with all these missing children's cases and did nothing. He found Henry, and Henry was willing to work with him. But to do that, he wanted this indie game developer to help him with his own project. To help kind of build this kind of, I guess you could say, time capsule. So that people will know what happened at these locations. He wanted him to do something bigger than just build these fake games that were just jump scare fodder. He wanted this story to be told in a hidden way. In a way that only those with keen eyes and an ability to discover it would be able to find. Now, I know you're wondering why the indie game developer would want to do this. Why Sam would want to do this. Now, from what we could tell, is that he is very much an in-game version of Scott Cawthon. We can tell that he was somebody that was trying to build his own legacy with his own games. And when that didn't work, and he actually got work to build these games from these 
urban legends from these histories, he actually took it and was willing to go with it. But he didn't really care for the way they wanted him to do it, just making it a jump scare, jokey game, these pizza games or whatever. He wanted to actually tell a story, a story that mattered, a story that mattered to him and to other people. And when Henry came to him, told him the full history of Fazbear Entertainment and the desk behind it, he couldn't help but be a part of it, want to get the story out there, want the children's voices heard, want the family's voices heard. So he wanted to be a part of it one way or another and was going to do it at all costs. It wasn't just that when Fazbear Entertainment got wind of all this that they finally decided that maybe it was time to cut their losses with him. They already got five games in it. They already got several arcade games from it. So now it was time for them to move on from that. Now, I'm going to tell you why I think that it was Henry who was influencing Michael Afton this entire time. And that is because of the way we are given in the FNAF World game. And I'm not talking Beta 1, I'm talking the Halloween update that we got that really shows this kind of alteration in the storyline. Now, I know a lot of people will not consider FNAF World to be this main canon storyline, and it shouldn't be. Because even now, I'm kind of struggling with it. Even the name FNAF World is Five Nights at Freddy's World. So, that would have to assume many canons don't make sense in the game series. But, with this idea that now we are dealing with a game inside a game, that should be given a small leeway into the idea of what's happening here. If not, it's at least giving this idea of how Michael Afton started this journey. When we first hear Michael Afton, it's in the games. We don't really know how he started looking into the deaths of Five Nights at Freddy's or the Fairy Fazbear uh, entertainment industry. All we know is that he started looking for his dad. But that tells me that maybe that someone told him. Many have suggested maybe William went to go look for him. Maybe he got a letter. Maybe he found something that was different. And I will tell you that my theory, though it is a bit on the rougher edges, is that Michael received a game console from Henry, or not from Henry specifically, more like the avatar he's using, Old Man Consequences, and that when he played it, waited for a few seconds, he started getting these corrupted files. He started seeing that it was saying something odder and odder, that it wanted him to dig deeper into the mysteries that are shown before him. Because remember, that's the whole point of FNAF World in that latest update, was going deeper and deeper, trying to figure out the mysteries, trying to solve the clues, and fight your way through it. Now, if we take that on a face value, we can say that maybe Michael played it, waited, and saw that the corruption, and even a familiar face was the one telling him this. And it was the Golden Freddy plush that we see in the game. Not an old friend of his, but an old friend of his little brother, which would catch his attention which would tell him a lot. And only ones that would actually know about that Golden Freddy stuffed toy would be William Afton or Henry because Henry basically was an uncle to them at that point. So with that being in mind, that would be where my first implication that this is what's happening in world at least. Another thing I would like to point out as leaning more towards that this is Henry going to Michael, there does seem to be an emphasis on family throughout the FNAF world game. There seems to be, even when you go deeper deeper into the kind of code of the game, you find all the secrets, it does have that picture of a guy with his two kids right next to him. That could be what we see Henry being, but more likely this is what we saw with um, William Afton and Michael and his little brother. Because they do look a little bigger to be compared to Henry and Charlie Emily. Because again, one of them would have to be a girl. And both of them seem to be boys at the very least. Watching the television or something. So that again leads to more of this idea that this was directly pointed at somebody. For somebody to play or for somebody to find. Along with other various things here and there that help push it. And only several people would probably understand some of these rules. And this would only rely on if there was a Five Nights at Freddy's game in this world. 
which we can pretty much assume is very much the case. My main piece of evidence that really started me on this kind of theory was what Henry said at the end of Pizzeria Simulator, and that was that And to you, my brave volunteer, who somehow found this job listing not intended for you. Although there was a way out planned for you, I have a feeling that's not what you want. I have a feeling that you are right where you want to be. This suggests that Michael was not the intended audience to receive this position to open up this kind of restaurant. So who was? Who was supposed to be involved in this that was not involved in the main story at all? My theory was always that it had to be either maybe Phone Guy if he was a separate entity or it had to be somebody that we've known throughout the game series. But after much consideration, it had to be the indie game developer. He was the only one that I could see actually working with Henry along the way, so much so that he was willing to go down with him at the very end. But something happened. He wasn't able to go and go the full nine yards with Henry at the end of the day, leaving Michael up to clean this up. So, what does that mean? It means that the game developer is still out there somewhere. Or maybe the darker take, what if that story from Tales from the Pizzaplex was right? What if they found him, captured him, and stuck him with those fear devices, if you will, those sound sonic devices, if you will, and they made him go crazy? Because they even admit that he's disappeared or that he is currently looking for a lawsuit against him. Because as I said, the lawsuit was pending, suggesting that it never went fully through. So we have no idea where he's at right now, but we do know that Ultimate Custom Night had to be created after the events of Pizzeria Simulator, suggesting that he is giving hints out there that they may have still have their ending, or their ending is still yet to come. We also know that the arcade machines with a similar taste to them are also different for Balloon Boy, for... Uh, moon and Sun, so there is a lot still going on that needs to be said, but for right now, we'll talk about his fate as it goes along the storyline. Now I want to talk about some of the points that might be against this, such as when Michael uh, is talking to his dad William, saying that he's going to come find him at the end of Scissor Location. This I do not believe is Michael. I believe that it is Baby, mimicking or using Ennard to mimic Michael's voice because right after that we do get this idea that his eyes turn purple so obviously it's not Michael talking and we do know that for at least a period of time they were disguised as Michael in his body going around doing stuff so much so that it made people around him turn away made people around him fear him he was probably aggressive and not really in the right mindset in fact we don't even know if he was really there to begin with so, for now, when they left his body, we can tell that he probably got himself back up and continued on with it. So, for that matter of fact, we can suggest that that's probably when Baby wanted to go look for William Afton, while Ennard went on to go become sort of like a Stitch Wraith kind of thing. Go on to be his own entity, try to become Molten Freddy, if you will. Custom Night seems to be the telling of Michael experiencing what happened too. Suggesting that maybe at some point he may have contacted this game developer as well. Or maybe that game developer contacted him. Suggesting that maybe he put it somewhere else too. And it could be said for the Ultimate Custom Night as well. Because that was after the death of William Afton. Along with Henry and Michael too. But I'll get to that part in a minute. Because I do think that's going to be an important factor. In kind of stitching this all together. And if you think I'm really grasping at straws with FNAF World being the main kind of Henry's game, being his main invitation to both Michael's involvement in his revenge or to find what's really happened, then think about this, will you? Every time we talk to Fred Bear, Golden Freddy, in the FNAF World, he talks about, are you willing to go further deeper? You can always stop and go back and live your life as it was. You are choosing to do this. You are choosing to go deeper and further down. And that speech, those way of speaking, are said in the very final speech of Henry's speech at Pizzeria Simulator, right? He talks about having volunteered for this, willing to go down for it, not wanting to stop, 
suggesting that they have similar patterns of way of talking. It could be said that this was code written or lines written by Henry to him in case he did want to do this. So it's very odd coincidence that they almost see the exact same things while at the same thing having the same ideals and same method of going about it. And even think about that name, Old Man Consequences. The last character we meet in FNAF World, he does come back in Ultimate Custom Night as well. It's been long speculated that this was Henry we're talking to. He is living with the consequences of his own actions. And what are those actions? Well, they're the same reasons why he wasn't the one to figure out or to save any of the animatronics along with his daughter. Henry is a smart man. He is a good man. He's tried to do everything he could to help as far as we know in the story. But he wasn't always like that. In fact, he disappeared from the pizzeria after the incidents with his daughter happened. And we do know that's the last story to happen as far as Henry and the original kids go. We do know that Charlie Emily is the last victim of the main few. We can tell that from the Ruin DLC where they talked about the missing kids. How Chica was the first and Emily, well Charlie Emily, was the last one. Suggesting that Henry knew what William was doing. He always knew. He just didn't do anything to help anybody. It wasn't until his daughter got involved that he really started planning. And not even then. It took years to figure it out what he wanted to do. And it took years to know what he had to do to get to this point. He didn't want to face the consequences of his actions. And that being he did nothing to help these children. He did nothing to calm the spirits. He didn't do anything to stop William. And that haunted him. That bothered him. And he knew that he wouldn't be the one to save them. He was living in the consequences of his actions. And that actions were he did nothing. And he wouldn't be the one to save anybody. So that's why when Michael suddenly came to the picture, it suddenly lashed onto him. This was a redemption arc for both Michael and Henry, who feel that they could have done more, but did nothing at the start. Maybe this is too much of a reach, but think of it like that. And like I said before in the beginning, we don't really know what Henry was doing this entire time. But we can tell that he was bothered that his animatronics were being used like this. We could tell that even he was bothered that they were bringing in older animatronics in on this too. And we know that Henry was the one pretty much funding the Pizza Really Simulator location because we can tell that they were the same animatronic styles used in the first location of Five Nights at Freddy's. Suggesting that he wasn't just paying for it, but he was providing all his stuff, giving this closure to himself. Putting everything he built and everything he created into one location and finally putting an end to it all and his legacy. This was about William, but it was more about Henry finding closure for the things he did or more likely didn't do along the way. And the reason he didn't go try to help Charlie, his daughter, was because he was ashamed he couldn't save her that night. He couldn't do anything and was helpless in the whole situation and felt bad that he couldn't help anybody after because he knows that the abductions didn't stop. They just kept going and getting worse and worse so now he is here living in the consequences of its actions and you could tell that this was what his plan was that he knew this is what was going to happen because again in FNAF world the question scene was what really pulled me in is that he told the game developer how he felt his ending was coming and that was at the hand of baby because that was the first time we were introduced to baby but it was also the last time we were introduced to Henry and his ending that's what he believed would happen, that the consequences, everything coming up to him, would likely stab him in the back at this point. And it did. It just didn't happen the exact way it happened in FNAF World, but it's very similar in a certain way. Now I bet you're wondering, the one question would be, how does he know all this? How does he know about the puppet? How do you know he brought life to these animatronics. How were they able to get everything so detailed and find where William Afton's locations were? Well, it's very simple really. We've known it since the beginning. We've known everything from the beginning, since game one actually. He watched it through the security cameras. He saw everything happen. 
As a co-owner, he has the rights to everything in and out of the pizzeria that belongs to Freddy Fazbear Entertainment. So naturally, he would have access to cameras. Now, I've known managers from fast food places that have seen cameras from their home because that's just the job they take in case they catch people stealing or doing whatever or robbing the house or robbing the main restaurant. So it doesn't stand to reason that the reason Henry knows all this, has seen all this, and is able to describe it so well is because just like us watching everything through the security cameras, Henry was doing the exact same thing. He watched it every night trying to find certain things. He knew everything that was happening. So he was able to describe what was happening and lock it away. In fact, I'm sure that he has it somewhere locked away for someone to find it. Maybe at the last pizza location? Who knows? Maybe we'll find it in a blocked box somewhere. That's for me to figure out later on, isn't it? As for the last piece of evidence I have to give that I do want to talk about, this one's more speculation, so let's get into it, shall we? Now, when I talked about the fate of the indie game developer, there was something I noticed and something that is just going to be speculation completely on my end. And that was that he had to disappear but sometime after Ultimate Custom Night was created and sometime after or sometime before the Pizza Plex was built because they said they were still trying to get a lawsuit against him. So if he did disappear in somewhere in those fame, that tells me that he is somewhere on the property. He is somewhere out there. And I think that he is the one who made those symbols on the wall in the room that was familiar to the sister location house. I think he was the one who made those symbols in a way. Mainly because the way they are spoken, the way they are talked about, seems to be talking like a video game. Seems to be talking about slashing, ducking, venting. These are all things that a normal person wouldn't say unless they were talking about a video game. So that tells me that this may have been him. They may have trapped him somewhere on the Pizza Plex's property and were keeping him there. Or he was hiding there to begin with. So that one's just speculation on my end because he's the only one I can actually see phrasing it and making it like that at the very end of his life. Giving a hint as he always has in a cryptic weird way and expecting someone like us who will dig into it, dig deeper into it to figure out what has happened to him or to find out what has happened to the Henry Emily family and Michael as a whole. But then again, that's just speculation and it's just a theory. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I really do um, think that this is a, a bit of a rocky one on my end, admittedly, knowing that there's some holes in there that really don't fit. But for the most part, I like to think that this is a pretty good synopsis of what Henry's side of the story was. Because I don't really hear that much about him other than pure speculation, just like this. But I do think that this is a fun way to kind of make it reinvent the character's purpose in the whole storyline. And uh, if you disagree with it, that's fine, because I know FNAF World in itself is a very not beloved installment of the series. But I liked it. I thought it was fun and added a lot to the story overall. And again, there are some things that are canon, some things that aren't canon. But that's part of the core when you think of Five Nights at Freddy's and Scott Cawthon material to begin with. It's never going to be a clean fit, but there are certain segments that will fit. Alright, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Please leave a like, comment, subscribe down below. I'd really appreciate it. Uh, leave your opinions on what you think this haul could mean or if you think I'm completely wrong. I'm willing to accept that too. <laughs> Thanks again for watching and I hope to see you guys next time. See you later and have a great day.